Welcome to the North America model for the Book of Mormon, From Jerusalem to Camorra, written by William Peter Lee. My name is Leroy Mon. I'm excited to be here with William as we explain this. Let me explain why I'm here. William, could you advance the next slide? True learning is knowledge and know-how coupled with belief and action. As the life of the mind is expanded by these factors, it never returns to its original dimension. I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to get to know William because he literally has helped stretch my mind as it relates to really studying and learning about the Book of Mormon. William has applied what I call the principles of learning. William, could you advance the next slide? The principles of learning are these. Number one, learning is absolutely a choice. Second, when we have a vision in mind of what we can become, we then are motivated to do those priority things that allow us to step in the right direction. Hopefully all of our learning, know-how, and skills help us to be more useful as we interact with those that are important to us and that the Lord puts in our path. It's super important that we seek to really apply the principles of understanding. And I want to compliment William for the work that he's done. He's taken his background and knowledge in architecture, and he has sought to look at the complex and make it simple. I think you'll be incredibly impressed as you see the understanding he's gained from the skills that he has developed over many, many years. The next principle of learning is unity, coming to a unity of the faith, unity of understanding so that we can be unified in our action and hopefully make a real contribution that's significant and real. And finally, as we continue to learn, grow, and understand and apply things, we literally are regenerating ourselves in the context of the present. Let's go to the next slide, William. So there are seven universal laws, and I'm going to invite you to look for these as William presents his information on the North America model, a geographic history of the Book of Mormon. First of all, look how he has multiplied his mindfulness by taking a look at the scriptures verse by verse to really understand the movements and the descriptions, the details surrounding the real people and actual events. It's interesting that as he has done this, he's been able to present to us actions in places that correspond to our vision. Think about Lehi and the vision that drew, drove him and Mulek and the Jaredites. The third principle or universal law is speaking and serving with positive energy. There's a positiveness about William's presentation that's compelling. And as my wife and I have studied the Book of Mormon and have looked at the North American model side by side, it's helped us to see with positive energy some of the experiences that these wonderful people have given to us. Four, we want to transform negatives to positive. As you think about some of the geographic challenges that these um, wonderful early saints had, it's impressive to see what William has done to actually give us some locations and descriptions and in, in real time. Next, how do we exercise agency for purposeful progress? I think William has done a, an exceptional job of utilizing his talents and his agency, and I'm going to invite you to look at the book and to see what it can do to help you in the purposeful progress that you're wanting to make. Now, R6. William has reviewed his work. He has renewed what worked. He released what didn't. He realigned with his deep purpose. And then he's refined and refined and refined this book. And hopefully it's presented to you now in a way that allows you to regenerate your interest and love and passion and compassion for the characters and the message. And number seven. How can we use this to yield to our best and highest self? I've been impressed and inspired with William's work, and it complements what the Book of Mormon is all about. I'm grateful to know William. I'm grateful to introduce him. So William, with that, teach us, my friend. Thank you, Leroy. 
I am William Peter Mitchley, author of the North American model for the Book of Mormon from Jerusalem to Cumorah, a geographic history of the Book of Mormon from beginning to end. The purpose of this presentation is to introduce you to how the North American model came to be and explain why it is compelling in its details. Please follow the PowerPoint slides as I provide the accompanying narration. <clears throat> At a 2017 BYU Book of Mormon conference, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave a talk that discussed the value of finding evidence that affirms the witness of the Holy Ghost. Elder Holland said, quote, In making our case for the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe God intends us to find and use the evidence he has given, reasons, if you will, which affirm the truthfulness of his work. But he goes on to say, Our testimonies aren't dependent on evidence. We still need that spiritual confirmation in the heart of which we have spoken, unquote. In other words, we should seek all physical and scientific evidence that the Lord has given, certainly that which has been given to us by commandment. It is in that context that the North American model affirms the witness of the Holy Ghost, proving how remarkably accurate the Book of Mormon is when it comes to the commandment the Lord gave to Nephi in 1 Nephi 9 to engrave on other plates an account of the reigns of the kings and the wars and the contentions of the peoples, for a wise purpose unbeknownst to Nephi. That command includes writing about the travels and journeys of the people, providing evidence of where the sacred as well as the contentious events occurred. Such geographic evidence, when discovered, certainly enhances the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon as being a witness of, the, of Jesus Christ. Proof that Joseph Smith was indeed the prophet of the Restoration, and that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, as Joseph said. The North American model also <clears throat> addresses the unfortunate situation where once faithful members may fall into faith crises, throwing away a sure knowledge gained by the witness of the Holy Ghost, for evidence which on the surface may appear to be anachronistic, or which conventional wisdom declares does not exist at all. In fact, the genesis of the North America model is the result of running into just such a sad case of misplaced faith crisis. But before I get into that, let me share you some, some background as to who I am. You may have asked the same question I had for myself. Why me? Let me explain. I'm a lifelong member of the church with fourth generation 1850s Utah pioneer heritage. Born and raised in and around Jackson County, Missouri, the center place of Zion. While I do not have the usual academia resume, most of my life has been involved in the profession of architecture, having graduated from the University of Michigan School of Architecture in 1960. It is what I did for a living for 50 years on a wide variety of building types, including 25 years on projects for the church throughout the Midwest. How does that relate to the skills that I bring to this topic? Architecture is one of the truly multidisciplinary professions in which the basic skill of the architect is in finding physically order in the theoretically complex. However, this work is not without peer review by individuals with serious academic credentials. Let me introduce you to my personal unofficial thesis committee. My older brother, Dr. James E. Mitchley, was a mathematics professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. He graduated from the University of Michigan Engineering School with three engineering degrees in four years with a 4.0 GPA, and he then received his PhD from Caltech in plasma physics. My brother-in-law, Dr. Ronald W. Walker, was a BYU history professor and highly respected LDS author, and Dr. S. Kent Brown is a BYU Emeritus Professor of Ancient Scripture, an expert in Near Eastern Studies. Dr. Brown responded to my analysis of his work on Lehi's travels through Arabia. He wrote to me, quote, I find your suggestion about the three days of travel to the River Laman to be intriguing. That view shortens the distance that the family traveled 75 miles to a more reasonable distance, unquote. Dr. Ronald, uh, Dr. Walker followed the work from start to finish. He wrote, quote, please keep going with the research. It looks promising. Certainly, we need new perspectives. You've done fine work. I hope that your project may go successfully forward, unquote. And my brother, who warned me that he had studied every model out there, 
His response, quote, it's a winner. You have a great thesis, and it couldn't be presented more convincingly. It should be published, and I have no suggestions for changes, unquote. All three responses would make any Ph.D. candidate smile. Regarding the Book of Mormon, I have believed it to be true ever since I was baptized at the age of nine in 1946. I was excited in 1948 by Thor Heyerdahl's Kantiki expedition to the Polynesian Islands, which proved that ancient peoples could travel great distances across oceans. Then in 1956, Milton R. Hunter's Archaeology and the Book of Mormon focused on Mesoamerica as a location for Book of Mormon events. However, Contiki, nor Mesoamerica studies, satisfactorily address issues such as how Jared, Lehi, and Mulek all ended up in relatively near each other in Central America, or in dealing with the problematic issue of how the place ended up in an obscure hill in upstate New York, 3,000 miles away. While the genesis of the North American model goes back 30 years, I began to address the subject in earnest seven years ago when I ran across a series of articles on Book of Mormon findings that piqued my interest. The first addressed a Book of Mormon challenge by a Marian Bodine, an ex-Mormon who was a staff member of an evangelical Christian radio program, the Bible Answer Man, that I ran into over 25 years ago. She tried to convince me that the Book of Mormon was false because of a claim in the narrative that clearly did not exist according to her. Quote, there is no continually flowing river of water in the Red Sea from Arabia, and everybody knows it. All of Arabia is just a desert, unquote. She emphasized the statement that everybody knows it as if that made it a slam-dunk killer argument. The 1999 article by George Potter published by the BYU Neil A. Maxwell Institute on the Valley of Lemuel, with a continually flowing river of water into the Gulf of Aqaba, the fountain of the Red Sea, flowing through a 2,000-foot deep granite canyon got the ball rolling. Articles on Nahum and Bountiful in Arabia by S. Kent Brown and by Warren P. Aston followed. <clears throat> Additional articles by Rodney Meldrum and the Firm Foundation on a 2009 expedition of a 600 B.C. Phoenicia ship replica that sailed clockwise around Africa and on the scriptural basis for the heartland model the land of the United States of America, were important. With that foundation, I prepared a synopsis of those findings utilizing the new technology of Google Maps to do what I had attempted to do 30 years ago previously, but without the false claim of the River Laman ringing in my head and the recently discovered findings in Arabia. It became part one of what eventually became the five-part North American model. Part one, Lehi's journey to the land of promise confirms that the Book of Mormon is to be a highly credible resource for geography. In only 23 or 4% of the 4,616 verses in 1 Nephi, a complete and accurate record of Lehi's 11 year, 11,000 mile journey to the land of promise, including a new understanding of 1 Nephi 2, helps us to appreciate how accurate the Book of Mormon describes geography when little of it was known in 1830 America. The following maps and screenshots in Arabia are from Google Maps. It was a 75-mile journey from Aqaba to the River Layman, discovered by George Potter, and which did not follow the then-well-known route of the Frankincense Trail that opened my eyes to the Book of Mormon geography. First Nephi 2, 5 and 6, which did not make much sense to me for the longest time, reads, quote, And he came down by the borders near the shore of the Red Sea, and he traveled in the wilderness in the borders which were nearer the Red Sea. And it came to pass that when he traveled three days in the wilderness, he pitched his tent in the valley by the side of a river of water, unquote. Voila. He did not travel three days in the wilderness from Jerusalem to the River Laman, a distance of 275 miles. That is further than most for even the Pony Express, or even 75 miles from Aqaba. He first came 200 miles to the Red Sea, then followed the Red Sea shore 44 miles by the border mountains that were near the shore, exactly as described by Nephi. He then came to the border mountains that were nearer the Red Sea, even to its shore, at which time he traveled 26 miles in the wilderness in the mountains that were nearer the Red Sea for three days. Till he reached 
the uh, Valley of Lemuel with the spring-fed river of water. That's the three days. The geography continued to hold true as they left the Valley of Lemuel, led by the Leahona, for four days, again in the wilderness, 60-plus miles, nearly south-southeast to Camp Shazar. Then two legs of the journey south-southeast, for a space of many days each, in the mountains along the west coast of Arabia to a place called Nahum. <clears throat> Uh, and then, quote, nearly eastward to a lush place called Bountiful, from where they sailed to the land of promise. Who would have known all of that in 1830 frontier America? From there, I had always visualized Lehigh sailing to the west coast of Americas, influenced partially by the Arnold Freiburg painting of Lehigh on the boat appearing to be sailing east. That changed with the article by Rod Meldrum, on the 2009 History Channel expedition of the 600 BC ship, uh, Phoenicia ship replica. The premise was that the Phoenicians sailed clockwise around Africa back to the Mediterranean Sea in 600 BC. The light then went on. That was the only reasonable way for Lehi to sail. In fact, the 2009 expedition came within 400 miles of the North America coast, following the ocean currents and prevailing winds in that latitude. It does not answer where Lehi landed, but it is a high probability that it was somewhere along the southeast coast of the United States. Part one, proving the credibility of the Book of Mormon for geographic forensics, I was encouraged to test it out in the Land of Promise, which I did after verifying part two directional probability for the migrations of Jared and Mulek. According to Helaman 6, quote, the Lord did bring Mulek into the land north where he ran across the bones of the Jaredites who had landed there previously, and Lehi into the land south, unquote. Alma 46 clarifies that all of the land south of the land of desolation, both on the north and on the south, a chosen land and the land of liberty, clearly referring to the United States of America, resulting with a high degree of probability that all landings were on the east coast of the United States. <clears throat> I then turned my attention to the land of promise, However, a different approach was necessary there since there was no starting point like Jerusalem other than north and south. The key is finding a benchmark geography feature that can be identified by the written narrative and which will affect the entire geography. Hills, valleys, and narrow necks will not do that. Major rivers can, and there is no more major river described than the River Sidon. Without taking the time to go through the scriptural and geographic rationale for the River Sidon, suffice it to be that the only river system in all of North America that meets all of the criteria for the River Sidon is the Ohio Lower Mississippi River system. In reality, the Ohio River is the extension of the Lower Mississippi. The Upper Mississippi is the actual tributary. The 1990 uh, Water Encyclopedia states, quote, at the confluence, the Ohio is even bigger than the Mississippi, and thus is hydrologically the mainstream of the whole river system, unquote. The Ohio Lower Mississippi River has as its head the land of Manti, the watershed of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, at the western foot of the Appalachian Mountains near the sea east, the Atlantic Ocean, 120 miles from Camorra. Sidon runs from the east towards the west, emptying into the sea west, the Gulf of Mexico. The Book of Mormon designates the Ohio Lower Mississippi River as the primary river system better than we do today. With the river Sidon identified, we can address the base models of both the Jaredites and the Nephites and Lamanites. The land of the Jaredites is in the northeast of the land described in Ether as a land which is choice above all the earth, again, the United States of America, and also described in Mosiah as a land of many, among many waters, unquote, near where the Mulekites landed. And it extended south following the Susquehanna River to the narrow neck of land of the Maryland-Delaware Peninsula, where the sea divides the land the Chesapeake Bay being the largest sea estuary that divides the land in all of North America. Next, I paraphrase summary of the scriptures of Alma 22, 27, 31, 35, 50, and 63, describing the base model of the Nephites and Lamanites looks like this. 
The land of Nephi is on the south. <coughs> the land of Zarahemla is on the north, separated by a narrow strip of wilderness from the East Sea, through the borders of Manti at the head of Sidon. Which river runs from the east towards the west? Zarahemla extending north around the wilderness borders of Manti, to the land Bountiful, south of Desolation. And other lands south of Bountiful, like Jershon on the east by the sea. This map is a refinement of the base map. The, quote, small neck of land between the land northward and the land southward, unquote, is between the East Sea, Lake Ontario, and the West Sea, Lake Erie, in the north where the Nephites lived. It separates Bountiful southward from Desolation northward. And Desolation is surrounded by seas in all directions, south, north, west, and east which means that desolation northward of Zarahemla is separated, separated from Zarahemla by a sea. The head of Sidon is the land of Manti, and the south wilderness and east wildernesses are south and east of Manti. Antionum is the Delaware, Maryland Peninsula, south of Jerson, and is near the seashore east of Zarahemla, and north of the land of Nephi, where the Nephites inhabited. Other minor lands of Zarahemla include the land of Melik, over by Jershon, and the city and land of Moroni, west of Antionum, on the south, near the straight line separating the Nephites and the Lamanites in the east. Also included are the lands and cities of Aaron and Nephi, near that straight line, and lands and cities of Lehi, Morian, Omner, Gid, Mulek, and Noah, running north along the the borders of the Shenandoah Valley and on to Ammoniah, three days north of Malik in the Wilkesbury, Scranton, Pennsylvania Valley. When I started on this journey, I had no preconceptions. It wasn't until I finished the base model that it suddenly hit me. Aha, the question and the answer. The question, is this the hill Cumorah in which Mormon hid the plates in the same place that Moroni deposited his final few plates ultimately to direct Joseph Smith to them? The answer, in a North America model, at the distance of 90 miles from the narrow neck which led to the land northward, to the hill Cumorah it is. <clears throat> the final composite map shown here indicates a strong correlation between the geography of the Book of Mormon and the geography of the United States of America just 1,300 years later. With a base model established, I tested all Book of Mormon events with 38 appendices and five postscripts, using the base model as a template. It passed all tests. Examples include A, the travels of the sons of Mosiah to the land of Nephi from Zarahemla. B, the journey of the 2,000 stripling soldiers from Jershon in the east to Judea in the land of Manti to defend the country in the west. C, the battle between Moroni and Zarahemna at the river Sidon, where Moroni and Captain Lehi <laughs> defeated the Lamanites as they crossed the river Sidon. And D, the 1925 documentation of ancient Native American trails throughout the east and south, which correlate exactly with the geography of the North America model. Postscript 1. After completion of the North America model, I conducted a grand tour to confirm geography, take photos, and test conclusions. It was a trip of 4,550 miles and lasted nine days. I was not disappointed. <clears throat> the detailed description of the journey is included in the book, along with many of the photos taken. In the interest of time, I will provide only one anecdote that was, serendipitous, as it was a serendipitous experience which did leave me with the impression that my journey through the Book of Mormon lands was not being directed just by Google Maps. I first drew through the coastal plains of South and North Carolina, where the North America model suggested Lehi landed, and where Nephi eventually went into the wilderness for a space of many days, where he stopped at Morganton, North Carolina, at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and called the place the Land of Nephi. It is 235 miles, a space of many days, to Morganton, North Carolina, located in the Piedmont, a land with extensive natural deposits of precious ores, ores, gold, silver, copper, and other precious metals. The Blue Ridge Mountains be uh, became the lands of Mormon and Ishmael, and the nearby standalone South Mountains qualifies as Mount Antipas. It sits at the base of the Linville Gorge, the location of the Waters of Mormon. 
from the Book of Mormon narrative, I knew that the waters of Mormon had to be nearby. I just needed to find them. Postscript 3 was one of the pleasant surprises of the tour, the waters of Mormon. I had initially checked out St. John's River in the Blue Ridge Mountains not far from Morganton, North Carolina. I emailed the photos to my son Gordon that evening. He wrote back, Dad looks nice, but it's not deep enough to baptize in like in that famous painting. <laughs> or I might add, like in the painting by Brian Call in the book, Illustrated Book of Mormon Stories. Or the same scene from the new Book of Mormon video series, Season 3. <clears throat> After finding a brochure on area for waterfalls that evening, I set out the next morning to check them out. I missed my cutoff at Linville for Linville Falls by 15 miles. Running behind, I decided to pass on Linville Falls, but with only one mile, I ran across a sign that said, This way to Linville Falls. Parking and taking a short trail down the gorge, I ran into one of the most wonderful sights of the tour. It certainly fits Mosiah 1830, quote, and now it came to pass that all this was done in Mormon, yea, by the waters of Mormon, in the forest that was near the waters of Mormon, yea, the place of Mormon, the waters of Mormon, the forest of Mormon. How beautiful are they to the eyes of them who there came to the knowledge of their Redeemer. The end, how blessed are they, for they shall sing to his praises forever, unquote. And it is only one of several falls and pools in the Linville Gorge that empties out at the city of Lehi Nephi. <clears throat> While the North American model relies heavily on the written word for geography, one of the common claims made by skeptics is that there is no archaeological evidence of any of the actual events in the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> some have even stated that if there was some, it should not take a PhD to find it. Sample statements include one from the National Geographic, quote, we know of no archaeological evidence that corroborates the ancient history of the Western Hemisphere as presented in the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and the Society does not know of anything found so far that has substantiated the Book of Mormon, unquote. <clears throat> in addition, the Smithsonian Institution has issued the following statement, quote, The Smithsonian Institution has never used the Book of Mormon in any way as a scientific guide. Smithsonian archaeologists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the North America, the new, of the New World, and the subject matter of the book. Unquote. The North America model offers many examples, but the following one is evidence of more than just a lucky guess for any potential 19th century Book of Mormon author. One of the most ironic, iconic, and memorable events in the Book of Mormon is Mosiah II where Mosiah called the people together so that King Benjamin could address them. Around 124 B.C., Mosiah made a proclamation that the people gathered themselves together throughout all the land, that they might go to the temple to hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. And there was a great number. And when they came up to the temple, they pitched their tent around about the temple, every man having his tent, with the door thereof towards the temple. For the multitude was so great that King Benjamin caused that a tower be erected, that thereby his people might hear the words which he should speak unto them, unquote. Near the center of the Hopewell culture in Ohio are several complexes documented by the National Park Service. One is the Seep Earthworks, a half day by foot from Chillicothe, Ohio, or the location of the city of Zarahemla, according to the North America model. It is dated by the National Park Service from 200 B.C. to 400 A.D., a period of time that correlates with the arrival of Mosiah in the land of Nephi and the ultimate destruction of the Nephites. It had two miles of embankments and enclosed 120 acres. The large circle in the center enclosure is about 50 plus or minus acres. At its center is a 30-foot high mound the size of a football field dating from 100 B.C. to 400 A.D., starting about only 24 years after the events of Mosiah II. According to the National Park Service, the mound, fully excavated in 1940, quote, covered the floors, fire pits, and burial of two very large connected buildings with a small building between them, unquote. Could it be that the two large buildings were the remnants of a 124 B.C. structure referred to in Mosiah II as a temple? in which burnt offerings were conducted as described in Mosiah 2 and 3, quote, And they also took the first things of their flocks, that they might offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses, unquote. 
and the small building between them could have been the base of a tower from which King Benjamin spoke. It is certainly feasible that 50-plus acres could accommodate a great number of people, maybe 20,000 people in tents. <laughs> Interestingly, that is as large a capacity as the conference center where general conference is held. My architectural sense, informed by the well-known designs philosophy that form follows function, tells me that the auxiliary enclosures were support spaces for the assembly function, such as sacrificial animal holding pens and enclosures for activities and games similar in function to our cultural halls today. It is typical that religious purposes are often ascribed to archaeological discoveries in the absence of written records. The National Park Service brochure acknowledges that when it states, quote, the mound builders left no written language or recorded histories, and no extant tribes are clear descendants of these people who lived so long ago, unquote. That said, it is interesting that the purpose of these structures has been ass assessed by the National Park Service as follows, quote, there is no evidence that people lived within these earthworks. Rather, these huge architectural wonders appear to have been designed for large ritual gatherings, unquote. How fortunate we are to have the recorded history of the Book of Mormon published nearly 100 years before these earthworks were excavated to confirm that belated independent archaeological assessment and to explain that the reason that there are no extant tribes is because the Nephites perished at the hands of the Lamanites around 400 A.D. While the North American model focuses mostly on geography, there are artifacts worth mentioning. The following is from the same brochure of the, on the Seath earthworks, earthworks. Quote, among the beautiful artifacts found here by archaeologists of the Ohio Historical Society in 1925 is the famous Seap Head, unquote. A point of interest is the comparison to present-day peoples from his, the Mideast is evidenced by this young Palestinian man from Hebron, Israel, near Jerusalem today. Without drawing definitive conclusions, it is a remarkable likeness. And who is to say that the sheep head is not a likeness of one of the leading Nephites of his day, possibly even Mosiah? While the sheep earthworks material is compelling enough, an aerial view today confirms that it is a major historical site of a people who actually lived during Book of Mormon times from 200 B.C. to 400 A.D. Even more compelling, however, is to take a time capsule trip back 2,146 years to 124 B.C. to realize that this complex fits the story of Mosiah II in ways that no one could have guessed at the time that the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. This illustration, painted by Bruce Brainerd of Saratoga Springs, Utah, brings reality to the sea earthworks as a poignant visual recreation of that iconic Book of Mormon event. And it is not enough that the current dots of the Hopewell culture are connected by the Book of Mormon. The National Park Service also includes plans of several other ancient similar sites and notes the following, quote, at nearly equal intervals, along the Paint Creek and the Scioto River Valleys, almost two dozen giant earthwork complexes are constructed by the prehistoric people referred to as the Hopewell culture. The brochure on went on to say, however, why uh, they built so many enormous earthwork complexes in this area remains a mystery, unquote. I have to admit that I had also wondered why. That was until I read Mosiah 25, Around 120 B.C., Mosiah desired that Alma speak to the people, quote, And Alma did speak unto them when they were assembled together in large bodies, and they went one from, to one, from one body to another, preaching unto the people, repentance and faith on the Lord. And now this was done because there were so many people that they could not all hear the word of God in one assembly. Therefore, they did assemble themselves together in different bodies, being called churches. And now there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla, unquote. And that was probably only seven of the two dozen complexes constructed by the time Mosiah 25 was written. And by the way, it did not take a PhD to connect this archaeological evidence with real Book of Mormon events. And the thought has not escaped this observer that the second century B.C. Nephites in Ohio may have felt no different than 21st century saints in present-day Utah where ch chapels are located on virtually every block. As Joseph wrote, quote, I told the brother that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. 
And a man could get nearer to God by abiding by his precepts than by any other book, unquote. In conclusion, it is fortuitously ironic that the root catalyst for the North American model for the Book of Mormon from Jerusalem to Gomorrah was an offhand comment by someone who had focused on what was not known at the time in Arabia, throwing away what may have been known by the witness of the Holy Ghost at a later time. One must be very careful relying on the argument. Something doesn't exist, and everybody knows it, so it must not be true. It may eventually be found. Let me encourage you, if you haven't already, to purchase the book, which can be found on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Noble. You will find it to be an engaging companion to your reading of the Book of Mormon, and as part of your home-based studies for the Book of Mormon during this anniversary year of 2020, utilizing the Come Follow Me curriculum manual. And it also will be a great resource for families to plan weekend and day trips and summer vacations to visit sites described in the book, in relationship also to the great historic sites related to the founding and preservation of the United States of America. And with that, I conclude with my testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that Joseph Smith was his prophet, who dictated the Book of Mormon by the gift, power, and inspiration of God, and who restored the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days, to which I bear testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And thank you.